Hey guys, and welcome to the Working Money Channel. So did McDonald's call the bottom of Bitcoin? <laughs> this coming from David Gokstein. All right, what's this even all about? So this was a tweet from McDonald's. Uh, is it because I said, wag me? Retweeting out Matthew Hyland's tweet, shout out to McDonald's for potentially marking the Bitcoin bottom. Apparently McDonald's tweeted this out back on January 24th. How are you doing people who run crypto Twitter accounts? And if you guys remember, January 24th was this day over here when Bitcoin saw its bottom of the trend. Bitcoin saw a bottom of about 32,000, 33,000, give or take. And now we're back up to $41,400 for Bitcoin. So an interesting observation here from David Gottstein. McDonald's, what do you know that you're not telling us? So we've got the Bitcoin chart up here. And guys, as you may have noticed, Bitcoin has seen a bit of a bump up, finding resistance right now at $41,400. Well, you know what's interesting about that? If I zoom out and take the Bitcoin trend on the daily and throw a Fibonacci down on here, look at where that ends up, right smack dab on the 0.236. So just zooming in here, Bring that chart over. You guys can see the 0.236 Bitcoin finding its resistance right up there. Old support is now new resistance. So are we going to break through this resistance? Is this the first stop on our way to the 0.702? And once we get to that 0.702, what is going to happen for Bitcoin? So I thought that was an interesting observation here, finding that resistance at $41,000. If you recall, I did a video a couple of days ago and um, I forget who was mentioning it. It was one of the TA guys. They were saying that $41,000 is going to be critical. Bitcoin does have to break through that price in order for uh, whoever that was, that particular technical analyst, uh, to be bullish again on Bitcoin. Sure enough, we're now at the $41,000 mark and uh, I guess we just have to wait and see. The other interesting thing that I wanted to mention was Bitcoin dominance. So Bitcoin dominance is going up a little bit. Yeah, this is a good sign, guys. Bitcoin dominance coming up. And, uh, you know, once we see that 702 mark, that is when theoretically, at least, it should fall again as altcoins finally take their turn to take off to the stratosphere. So this would be Bitcoin dominance. Uh, meanwhile, altcoin prices will go to the moon. And so what's happening with altcoins right now? So we've got the market cap right now at $1.7 billion, uh, Bitcoin dominance at 42%. And uh, we're seeing the entire market move right now. How do we know if we are in an altcoin season? Maybe there are some coins already that have taken off. Right now, just taking a quick glance here at the uh, coin market cap, we are seeing many of the altcoins up uh, eight, nine, 10%, give or take. So are there any coins right now that uh, maybe we're not paying attention to that have already taken off? Well, uh, I do like to do this every now and then. Go to the 24 hour increase and take a look at some of the coins that have done the best in the last 24 hours. Now take a look at their ranking number, 4,365th on the list, uh, 2,449th on the list, 6,082nd on the list. So all these coins that have done the best so far are still very far down on the list. So what does that mean? Not a lot of liquidity. Um, and so big moves, big money being pumped into these coins means that these coins will go higher faster. So this to me signifies nothing really. Not so much of an alt season. These are the coins that are performing the best and uh, you can see it petering out here at 200%, 150%, so on and so forth. Not the top 20 coins. And in my opinion, once we see those top 20, top 50 coins, give or take, really start to take off, I think that is the sign of the alt season. We've got Michael at Val5 Links bringing this to our attention too. Okay, so Ted Cruz, he just made a Bitcoin purchase apparently. He made a Bitcoin purchase during the recent dip according to a new financial disclosure with the US Senate. The disclosure dated February 4th shows Cruz made a Bitcoin purchase valued anywhere between $15,000 and $50,000. We don't know for sure. Cruz made one purchase on January 25th using River. On the day of the purchase, Bitcoin price was hovering just under $37,000. So Ted Cruz obviously knew when to buy the Bitcoin. Uh, just bringing this chart back up here, Bitcoin on the daily. We could see that bottom was on January 24th. And then the very next day, Ted Cruz makes his purchase. Cruz has become a crypto advocate in recent months, introducing a resolution for Merchant on Capitol Hill to accept cryptocurrency payments and pushing for amended language to address industry concerns in the hotly debated infrastructure bill. Cruz introduced an amendment to remove the language in the bill aimed at tightening reporting requirements for digital asset brokers. Uh, some crypto industry players worried the broker definition as it stands is too broad uh, and could encompass entities that can't feasibly report the required information. 
So there, we've got the latest news here from uh, Senator Ted Cruz buying his Bitcoin position. Wanted to thank Michael for posting that. Uh, we also have this with regards to Bitcoin, just going back to the chart here, Matthew Highland here on Twitter. Also the guy who noticed the Bitcoin, or rather the McDonald's tweet predicting the bottom of the, uh, of the Bitcoin market. He brought this up. The upcoming weekly close will be very interesting. So today is Saturday and the close will be tomorrow. And he's likening it to the NASDAQ, what we saw in 1997 to 1999. Take a look at this pattern here and take a look at Bitcoin 2020 to 2022. This is on the weekly and uh, you can see how similar these patterns look. Now, I was reading in the comments section, some people are like, well, what does the NASDAQ from the late 90s have to do with Bitcoin? These are two very, very different things and they're decades apart. Like, well, what's the correlation here? And what I have to reiterate here is trading, charting patterns, all they are essentially is psychology charted on a page. So this is human behavior, how humans are deciding to buy and sell digital assets. And it's all being charted with candlesticks in this case. This is why we see old resistance become new support and vice versa, so on and so forth. Anyway, before the NASDAQ crash, that uh, dot-com bubble in the early 2000s, we did see a pump up. And so uh, this just demonstrating perhaps what we could possibly see based on human psychology for the Bitcoin bull run. So another interesting uh, case study here, Matthew Hyland down here saying, you know, the NASDAQ was an expanded flat. If Bitcoin bottom, it would be a running flat. Shout out to TechDev for discussing this and bringing attention to it over the past few months. And so um, you guys can just take a look at that, the differences between expanded and running. I will link this in the description if you guys are interested. And did you hear what David Schwartz said? Breaking news, I have been asked to resign. What? It's a tweet thread though. He says, I've been asked to resign a document because it was filled out incorrectly. This joke was based on a true story. Got a text today from a family member. You need to resign immediately. It was about a contact that was filled out incorrectly and needed to be done tonight, but I wasn't sure for a few seconds. So, you know, people in the XRP community, not too happy with the joke. David could never resign. Just down here, uh, XRP Crypto Wolf saying David could never resign. Ripple and XRP, even if he truly wanted to. Jungle Inc, of course, saying just flip the switch on the way out the door, all right? Never do us like that again. Not funny, says Dictator Know-It-All. Um, yeah, I don't think too many people would be too happy if David Schwartz did resign his post at Ripple. Of course, we know all the great things that David Schwartz has been responsible for over there at Ripple and, uh, you know, being part of the creation of XRP. Understanding the limitations of Bitcoin, creating a Bitcoin 2.0 that is able to scale, moving away from proof of work. And so here we have it, the digital asset that is going to run the world, XRP. Uh, I guess I never did talk about XRP price. Let me just go back here real quick. XRP uh, just following the market now, right now trading at about 67 cents. So uh, following Bitcoin, not too much movement. Uh, otherwise, not too much excitement. Well, I mean, I guess some people in the XRP community are excited to uh, see it go up about 10 cents from 56 cents to 67 cents, 11 cents right now. Uh, depending on how much XRP you have, that could be a huge chunk added to your portfolio. The other thing though, uh, we're still trading on low volume. So not a lot of trading going on. That is definitely something we should make note of. And uh, then there's the court case, guys. The update here, Jeremy Hogan just did release a video yesterday. And Ant1 on Twitter just posted this. Now that Judge Torres is back in action, major rulings expected to be made at a faster pace. If Hogan's suspicions prove true, if the court maintains its decision on the DPP, the lawsuit could end faster than expected and the XRP holdings would be un frozen. So guys, as I mentioned, Jeremy Hogan did do a video on this. I will link this video in the description. I suggest you guys watch it to get the full details. Here are some of the highlights though. Ripple and XRP holders given great sign from Judge Torres. Judge Annalisa Torres is back in action and she favors public disclosure, which should favor Ripple as the judge will have a say in the deliberative privilege issue. So Judge Annalisa Torres has granted in part and denied in part a request from Ripple and individual defendants to seal exhibits. In the ruling, the court ordered three documents to be unsealed and uh, we have talked about those three documents, the notice of Brad Garlinghouse's deposition, uh, Chris Larson's email string and the Brad Garlinghouse email. Uh, the files can be read by clicking on the link. So I will link this in the description if you guys want to read those in detail. The judge also denied Ripple's request to seal legal memos provided to Chris Larson and briefing associated with those memos. As to Ripple's request to file sir reply to the SEC's motion to strike the fair defense notice, the court granted the defendant's wish. Uh, the sir reply will be filed 
on February the 9th. So we only have to wait another four days for that. That's coming up next week. The order demonstrates how the court sees the SEC versus Ripple lawsuit, a case of public interest that deserves public access. So this is one of the big points here that Jeremy Hogan mentioned. Uh, the fact that the judge in this case uh, sees the importance for these uh, documents to be public, and so this is what she has granted. Down here, Judge Torres favors public disclosure, as I just mentioned. Jeremy Hogan says there's only one major takeaway from this order on the Ripple versus SEC case. Uh, judge Torres is getting ready to take over. So uh, Judge Netburn has been the assistant judge up until now. Now Judge Torres going to be coming down with her final verdicts soon. The next couple of months will be very interesting with all the major rulings that are being teed up. John Deaton also uh, commenting on this. The attorney for XRP holders. He says what these rulings clearly show is that Judge Torres favors public disclosure. Ripple can't seal certain documents. Same applies with the SEC. Think ahead. We may ultimately get to see the 63 Hinman emails. So that is also something that uh, could be exciting. And so just going back to some of those documents here, Jeremy Hogan uh, highlighted a couple of them in here in this video, despite a proven track record of being good stewards of XRP. This is coming from the Brad Garlinghouse email. We had continued to hear concerns in the market that Ripple could hypothetically sell our 61 billion XRP at any time, a scenario that would be certainly bad for Ripple. So with the decision to lock up 55 billion XRP in escrow, we have given investors a predictable supply schedule and removed what skeptics have suggested has been a barrier. What Jeremy Hogan explains here is that um, on the surface, this could look bad. However, he points out the fact that who was this email directed to? It was directed to uh, employees at Ripple, so maybe not as bad as originally intended. This is good news. He also uh, mentions this email from Chris Larson to an XRP hodler named Carlos. We believe XRP is uniquely valuable in the new world we're entering as a bridge currency to initially eliminate inefficiencies in the way payment providers finance payment flows. See the white paper. Thus, the strategy of focusing on connecting banks serves both emerging trends. Uh, the more banks that connect through Ripple Connect and ILP, the more demand we should see for XRP as an asset to reduce liquidity costs. Essentially saying, we need to see that liquidity for XRP to gain value. And, um, you know, it was surmised that the SEC might use these paragraphs in these emails uh, to strengthen their case. So will that work? Can it work? Well, it's funny because Jeremy Hogan later on Twitter, after releasing that video, he says it's embarrassing when you make a video and talk about thinking like a lawyer. And BJ Hodges comes along and thinks of an argument five times better than yours and puts it on Twitter for the whole world to see. Next time you come up with genius, just DM me, okay? What was that comment? Essentially, BJ Hodges uh, writes, Thanks, Jeremy. The email to Larson appears to be from an overseas individual. A U.S. individual would not refer to purchasing 30,000 euros worth of XRP. So uh, I did not actually read that part of the email, but that was definitely part of it. Therefore, how would this actually be relevant? So boom goes the dynamite. BJ Hodges here pointing out the obvious. Chris Larson in this email was uh, directly talking to an international XRP hodler, someone who the SEC has no jurisdiction over. So will this particular argument be null and void? It's a very good question. Jeremy Hogan obviously thinks so. We do still have to wait and see. Now, Jeremy Hogan uh, originally predicted that the lawsuit could go on until 2023. That was an original prediction from either last month or the month before. But now that we've seen these new developments, now that we know Judge Torres is on the case, we are awaiting verdict he thinks this could, in fact, wrap up sooner. So in 2022, we will see a verdict for XRP Clarity in the United States. Could this just be the first leg up for XRP, guys? And that utility, I mean, the Great Reset using XRP globally in a new financial system. I mean, that is the global plan for XRP, just moving out to a more broad outlook here. Uh, which brings me to this, and I, I know I don't usually talk about this kind of thing on the channel, but I thought today I thought it was important. Um, because there's a lot going on in Canada right now with regards to um, demonstrations to preserve our rights against globalist elite agendas. I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard this. Uh, Tom Fitton here on Twitter posting this, Globalism in Action, Biden pressures foreign company Spotify to censor Joe Rogan. I mean, I don't know if you guys have heard the whole story and countless other Americans, and now Trudeau government pressures American company GoFundMe to defund Canadian protesters. So um, this is just one thing that um, is terribly upsetting. You know, free speech in Canada, the United States, the Western world, wherever, is one of those fundamental rights that uh, us, that we should have. 
and we are now seeing a government try to suppress this. Um, some people down here responding, if we as a group stop buying products and stop paying our bills, these companies won't ever get money. Sure. You know, but you know, th this is a bigger, bigger issue. They are, the Canadian media is framing this as uh, racism, misogynism, a terrorist group, when it is clearly none of that. I'm trying to be very careful on how I phrase things on this video. Um, but here's just one from Jeff Elliott. This is the Winnipeg event. Uh, and as you guys can see, I'll link these in the description. As you guys can see, peaceful. Everybody here being very, very uh, well behaved. Um, you know, of course, you're going to see some bad actors, but by and large, everybody has, uh, and I mean, the, the, the protest has expanded. So this is Winnipeg. Here are some uh, high school kids protesting, and uh, this is just in front of their high school. Take a look at that. And finally, from Ottawa, here's a clip. Um, is this Ottawa? I don't even know if this is Ottawa or not, but here's another clip with fireworks as protesters watch on. Guys, this is not what the government says it is, and we know Canada's Prime Minister connected with the World Economic Forum. It's a shame because, you know, in my personal life, I try to explain this to people. I try to explain this without sounding cuckoo, cuckoo. And, you know, it's, it's difficult to get people who have bought in to this on board. So what happened was now the fundraising page has been taken down by the original fundraiser. I don't have to say the name. You guys know who they are. They had originally raised $10 million and the Canadian government put pressure on this company saying, no, we're not going to give it to them. Back to Tom's point here, globalism in action. So what did they do? Started a new fundraiser. And guys, I'm going to leave the link in the description. Here is the link URL. I'm going to show it on the screen. And look at how much they have already raised in less than 24 hours, just over three quarters of a million dollars. Um, now, I got to warn you, this uh, this backend interface on this website is a little glitchy, so you might get booted off because of the sheer uh, volume of people donating right now. I do think this is an important cause in order to end this nonsense. I'll put it to you this way. If you don't agree with what Klaus is doing, go and support your local rally. I know lots are happening around the world, including in the US, uh, Australia, many parts of Europe as well. I mean, my entire Twitter feed was full of this kind of thing this morning. So, you know, it is important. It does connect to the world we're living in and um, ultimately not only a new financial system, but a new world that we could be living in if we don't put our foot down, guys. The other thing that I noticed was uh, kind of interesting. I, I had stopped this video. I'd stopped recording and I thought that I would re-record this ending because I it's just so important that I thought I'd tack it onto the end of the video. And as I was doing that, I also noticed... I also noticed this part here. So just going back to this Chris Larson email from an unrelated story with the Chris Larson email, when he talks about, we believe XRP is uniquely valuable in the new world we're entering as a bridge currency to initially eliminate inefficiencies in the way payment providers finance payment flows. Chris Larson is even wording this in the new world we're entering in. He's not talking about XRP as just a new technology, a new innovative solution for payments. It's a new world we're living in. And need I remind you, this was way before the beer flu. February 6th, 2017 was when this email was originally published by Chris Larson. So, I mean, there are a lot of things to think about, guys. Wow, take a look at that. Over $870,000 now. That's just my opinion. And uh, sincerely, if you guys can donate, I think it'll go a long way.